Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I will be reading Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. After he had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now, a centurion had a servant who was sick and at the point of death, who was highly valued by him. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him, earnestly saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation, and he is the one who built us our synagogue. And Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but say the word and let my servant be healed. For I too am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turning to the crowd that followed him, said, I tell you not, even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to their house, they found the servant well. Thank you, Alex. It's great to see everybody today. We've got a few more families back, and so that's always a good thing, being able to see some familiar faces. I won't say old faces, uh, familiar faces that uh, we get to see again, and uh, it's always great to be able to be together in the Lord. We've been talking about being conformed to the heart of Christ and what that really is all about. And one of the basic things that that means is going to be about faith. Because as you look at the Bible and you look at the stories that are found there, almost all of the stories are stories about faith. They're either stories about great faith where something amazing happened or they're stories about where the person didn't have any faith or they lost faith in something and disaster happened. But a lot of them, as you look at the story about Jesus, Jesus encountered people every day. There were probably hundreds of people that he ran into. We read about crowds and multitudes, and so why put the stories in that they put in? Most of those stories are about faith, and that's why he wants to do that. And so the one we're going to look at, or we're going to look at four actually today, and so, the one that uh, Alex has just read to us is about a centurion, not even one of the Jews, a Roman centurion. And so, it's amazing what this story tells us. Because Jesus said, I haven't found faith like this in anyone, even in all of Israel. The people who should have faith, the people who have had promises God. And so, that gives us some hope, doesn't it? You don't have to have the long background. You don't have to have come from the lineage of Abraham. Some of us normal people, I'll say we're normal. Some of us normal people are able to have this kind of great intensity of faith as Jesus looks at this and he describes all of these things. So the centurion has a servant that's sick. I'm sure you got this from the reading. He highly values him, which I find amazing to begin with. We need to look at the character of this centurion and the fact that not only is he a commander, but he highly values people. And not just other warriors, but even his own servant. To the point where he asked the Jews to heal him. Well, they don't know how to do that, but they know Jesus. He's heard about Jesus, and so he... They call for Jesus, and uh, all of the elders of the Jews begin to say, this is a good guy. You need to do something for him. Have you ever had people vouch for you, or maybe you vouched for somebody else and said, well, this person's really good, this person's really important, uh, you should do something for them. You've known those kind of people, right? The ones that you respect, the ones that you trust. They have huge respect for this guy. He's one that has given to them. He's one who has built their synagogue. And so there's a tremendous amount of respect. Well, Jesus says, okay, I'll go. And so he goes with them to heal. And 
this is the important part of the story, I guess, as he gets close and the centurion sends out someone else and says, no, don't come because it's too much trouble and I'm not worthy. You're a centurion in the Roman army. What do you mean you're not worthy? You're the one who's supposed to have all of this grandiose ideas about how important you are. And we see that in a lot of other people who are in that position. And yet he's not. He has great respect for everybody else. He has great respect for Jesus. And because of this, it is called his faith. And he says to him, all you need to do is say the word. That's it. You don't have to come here. You don't have to be here. All you have to do is say the word. He says, I understand what that means when you say the word. Uh, It's much bigger than can you get me a cup of coffee, and it's a matter of something that is huge. When you say the word, it will be done. Absolutely no questions. We don't have that so much in our society today. It's did you promise? Did you sign anything? Is it documented? Do you really have to? After all, you could probably sue and get out of it, right? Very seldom do we find this kind of dedication that says, you know what? Everything I say happens. Everything you say, I will take to be absolutely true. That's almost a different kind of world, but that's what Jesus is looking at as somebody who can live to that kind of a standard, and he's going to say, this is what's important. You are able to say this. You are able to just say the word because I believe you're son of God. I believe you have that much power. You have, well, they didn't have power over disease even. I mean, a doctor takes a while, right? But he's heard about Jesus, and so he believes in Jesus to the extreme and says, all you have to do is say the word, and it will be done. He says, I understand that. I tell a person to go. I tell a person to come. I tell a person to do something, and it is done. Jesus is impressed that a person would listen to God's commands and take them that way. And he's maybe going back to the very beginning and the basic of all of this as we look at the Bible, because that's the way it all began, isn't it? Let there be light, say the word, light appears. Let there be a separation of the waters, and there is. Let there be sun, moon, and stars, and there is. All because of a word that is spoken by God. He believes in an all-powerful God who speaks things into existence, who changes disease forever, who is able to do anything, and that's who he believes Jesus is. That's great faith. It's not, well, what does your church teach? It's, uh, no, we have a God who responds like this. And what we believe about someone shows up in our response to them. And so he's giving Jesus this great honor, even though he's probably the voice in that region, being a centurion, he says, no, I give you greater honor than me. I'm not even worthy to have you come into my house. And so it's a response of faith that proves how much he believes in God and the greatness of God. Jesus is impressed. He says, I haven't seen this kind of faith, this kind of absolute authority with no question whatsoever. But I think it's because he lives his life like that. And so that brings us to the question, do we live our life like that? Or do we have to talk people into things and say, well, yes, I really believe this. Well, how much? Yeah, there's all that money and mouth stuff. We say, well, no, I didn't want to invest in it. I just wanted to say I believe something. And, well, how much? That's not the only one. That's the one Jesus points out and says, here is your great faith. 
The one right after that in, in Luke chapter 7 and verse 11 doesn't even have people of faith asking for anything. And yet I think this is where he begins to talk about this great faith. It says, soon afterward, he went to a town called Nain and his disciples, and a great crowd went along with him. And he drew near the gate to the town, and behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, do not weep. And then he came up and he touched the bier. And the bear stood still, and he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. And fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, a great prophet has arisen among us. And God has visited his people. And this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. What an amazing story. And yet there's no hero in this story who's a man of great faith who said, can you heal my son? Instead, we see a, a woman who has lost everybody. She's a widow, and her only son now has died, and she's left alone. It seems as if there's a lot of people there for her because a lot of people have come with her, and she is in the funeral procession to go out to bury her son. As you look at this story, though, there are some amazing things that happen here. Jesus chooses this occasion to amaze people. Why don't we have this faith? Why didn't anybody ask? But Jesus is trying to say, I have this kind of power. I am able to do this. You need to look at the problem differently. The centurion was able to look at the problem and say, all you have to do is say the word. Here, they didn't even ask. They don't think of it. It's not something that God has to do. Everybody knows that we all live, we're born, we die. It's the process. It's how things happen. And to interrupt that process is something that well, we don't really think about all that much. I mean, I'm sure prayers were said and things like that, but nobody thought to go and call Jesus. And he says to her, don't weep. Seriously, he says, do not weep. That's a command, right? If we're going to take the word of God to be seriously like the centurion says, all you have to do is say the word. He says, don't weep. And we need to know that, okay, Jesus said this. Now, that's something we need to look at. And then he turns and he comes up to the bier, the way in which they're carrying him. Doubtful if it's, if it's a casket, but they're carrying him to the point of, of his burial. And he says, arise. He says, young man, I say to you, arise. Which I find interesting. Why didn't you just say arise? And he's very specific. Young man, I say to you, arise. As he talks to the person who's died. Because if you're not specific, everybody around you is going to get up, Right? And so you got to say who you mean by this. And so, young man, I say to you, arise. And sure enough. But it's odd the way Luke puts this. And I find this in just one of those odd things that you find in Scripture, kind of irrelevant, but just odd. It says, and the dead man sat up and began to speak. Wouldn't it be the man who had been brought to life sat up? Luke's a doctor. He should know these things, right? But that's not what he says. He says the dead man sat up and began to speak. And then when he stood up, came about the phrase, dead men walking, and uh, the living dead and zombies were born. Uh, no, that's not right. 
<laughs> Not right at all, but it's interesting the way that he puts it. Luke has even a hard time talking about it this way. He, he talked to him and said, arise, and, and that's who it is. You've got to identify him in the situation, I guess. And so then it's dead man. It's you arise. And he sits up and he begins to talk and everybody gets afraid. Why are they afraid? Well, because we didn't expect this. Um, you should be afraid when dead men come back to life. Uh, it's not the way we think about it. And yet Jesus is saying, why didn't somebody ask? Why didn't somebody stop me as we're going along the road? Why didn't you say this? Just to let you know that I have the power for this. And the whole thing is the fact that we just don't think that way. And sometimes we don't think in the way God wants to respond to us. And so, who do you give authority to? Who has the say in your life? Who do you look at and say, this person has absolute say when they say something, it's going to be done? Well, hopefully God is first on that list, and there may be some others of varying degrees, but basically we give authority or we listen to someone who's important to us, someone we care about, someone we love. They're going to get special attention. We want to make sure that they're going to get what they want or what they need. And so there carries a certain amount of weight when they call or when they ask. And so, yes, that's going to happen. Sometimes it's a matter of consequence. If they ask, we get fired or we may not get paid or they may have an in incentive for a reason why we should listen to them because they hold some sway over things. Someone who can get us in trouble with other people, perhaps. Listen to that person. And whatever they tell you, you probably need to act on it. And then sometimes it's just the person who's right in front of you because they're right in front of you and you don't want to ignore somebody who's just right in front of you. Not really authority, but certainly your attention is being demanded. I saw this sign. The sure sign of spiritual growth, keeping your word is more important than keeping up in appearances. And so that's maybe the other person, is the person who keeps what they say. They are going to do it. You know they're going to do it. Anytime they say it, it's going to happen. And we understand that. We know that there are some people who say a lot of things, but it's not really going to happen, is it? I mean, they talked about it. They said they might, and, they, and we take it, well, they might. And even when they say, I definitely will be there, we know that there's going to be an excuse. There's going to be some reason why they're just really not going to be able to anymore. And those people don't carry as much authority with us. Don't be one of those people. We need to be one of the people like the centurion because it is all the way through his life. The fact that he lives that way, he can see God that way. And I find the people who, you know, make lots of excuses and, you know, you can kind of depend on them sometimes, but they're not always going to be there they kind of don't see God that way either because they're not like that. And so part of this whole idea about faith and about being this person of authority and about giving God this kind of authority is we need to be those kind of people that does everything that we're going to say, that any time we're asked about it, yes, this is going to be taken as absolute. And if I tell you I'll be there, I'll be there. And you know people like that, and you know the amount of respect you have for them. And that's what Jesus is trying to teach here. This is absolutely important. They don't necessarily exaggerate. They're, they might tease, okay? But when it comes to God, they're going to do everything that they say, and the actions back up their words. It's not just a matter of saying, oh, well, I believe this, and then nothing else happens, but you know those kind of people, and you know how you respect them. 
And Jesus is saying, be one of those people because it leads to the respect of God and it leads to the fact that now we can represent God. And Jesus looks at that kind of person and says, that's a man of great faith. There's another time in Luke 8, verse 22, a familiar story about the storm on the sea. It says, and one day they got into a boat and his disciples, and he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out, and they sail, as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down the lake, and they were filling with water and were in danger. And they went and woke him, saying, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased. And there was a calm. And he said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid, and they marveled, saying to one another, Who is this? That, the, that he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. Well, what an amazing thing. You look at the danger words, and there's a windstorm, there's danger, they're filled with water, there's danger, and he, he gives you all of these words that lead up to this cry for help. And so they wake him up, and the first news is we're all going to die. Well, that's not exactly the way to approach God. We're all going to die. That's not so much faith. They wake him up because of the situation they're in, but I'm not sure they had any hope of what was coming next because of the response after this. And when Jesus sees it, he gets up, he speaks to the wind, he speaks to the storm, and he says, peace, peace. Be still, or hush. It's the Aramaic form, you understand. Be calm. And so he speaks this calmness into it. And then he turns to them and he says, where's your faith? Why did you wake me up saying that we're going to die? Don't you know who you have in the boat with you? And they are amazed that he could command the wind. So obviously, they never thought that before. They never thought he has authority over water, over storms, over wind, over anything like that. Sure, he's the son of God. Uh, They're getting to that conclusion. Sure, he's important. Sure, he's a great religious leader. But the authority he had for situations in their life is not complete yet. Because they get to a storm and they see the storm as bigger than anybody in the boat. You got to realize who's in your boat with you. Because if Jesus is in your boat with you, it's going to change everything. And we give him authority to command we should have looked at the situation differently. They should have seen who was in the boat with them. The centurion, if he'd been in the boat, he would have said, Jesus, we need just one word, peace. And he knows it would happen. Be still. And it is. Do we ever ask God to say that word? When our life is full of turmoil and there's all kinds of things going on around us and there's a lot of things that are happening that make us feel like we're in danger, do we ever ask him to say peace and believe that everything would be calm? It will all work. It will all be fine. That takes a lot of faith, doesn't it? Because we see numbers. Are numbers bigger than words? Are numbers bigger than Jesus' words? When Jesus commands, it brings a different answer. What authority does God have over you and the situation you're in? And I see him saying this all the time and wanting them to get to this. When he speaks, how do we respond? Do we respond in panic? God, it's really bad now. Or do we just say, all you have to do is say the word. 
I saw this. Stop telling God how big your storm is. Instead, tell the storm how big your God is. It's just an easy way of saying, do we understand God's authority? You don't have to come, God. You don't have to be here. Just say the word. We don't need you to row. Just say the word. And since we know that, we know what will happen because we believe. Well, the stories keep going all the way through. As you look at Luke in 826, there's a demon-possessed man, and Jesus just asks him, what is your name? His name is Legion, one of those scariest names ever. And as he heals the man... The demons are cast out. They go into the pigs. The pigs run down and are drowned in the sea. And he says, I want to go with you. I don't want to be here. Everybody's seen me naked in the tombs and cutting myself and screaming and crying out. And I want to go with you. I want to be a missionary with you. And what does Jesus say? He says, return home and declare how much God has done for you. And he does it. There's no whining. But God, I really don't want to do that. I would rather do something else. I could be a benefit to you. There's no complaining. Don't you know how these people treat me here? They're going to blame me. I ruined the economy. They're going to blame me for all of this. And no, there's none of that. At least it's not apparent in the story. It's just... God spoke, and he told you to do something. And he says, okay. He recognizes the authority of Jesus. Luke 8, 40, there's Jairus whose daughter dies, and a woman in the middle, and the woman believes if I just touch the fringe of his coat, and sure enough, she's healed. He didn't even have to say a word with her. They don't believe the child's going to live, and yet Jesus says, no, just watch. And sure enough, the child comes back alive. He sends out the 12 in Luke chapter 9. They have the word that he has given to them because they have been listening to this all this time. And so he sends them out to speak, and they are amazed at how the response comes back. Because God is speaking through them. Down in verse 10, you see the feeding of the 5,000. And so you have all of these people, and they've been listening to the teaching, and it's been going on and on and on. And he tells his disciples, you give them something to eat. And they go, oh, we can't do that. We don't know how to do that. We don't have enough money for that. And nobody believes it until after you've finished and fed everybody and now you're picking up the trash. He's actually making you pick up the trash and people are realizing how much is left over from five loaves and two fish. You realize what happened. Even though nobody got it, everybody obeyed his word. He said, sit down in groups of 50. They did. He said, pass this out. They did. He said, get your basket and pick up. They did. There is no question, but what when Jesus speaks, these people respond, and it's why the stories are there. It shows in the way they treat the authority of Jesus. It says, you know what? If he said it, it's all going to happen, and we are going to do it. What an amazing faith that is. But that's what it requires. The last one we want to talk about today is in Luke chapter 9 and verse 28. One of those strange stories. I wish I was there. No, I'd probably be scared, but I still wish I was there. Now, it was about eight days after these things, he took him with him, Peter and John and James, and they went up to the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were standing with him, Moses and Elijah, 
who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. As he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. Who would believe it? It's interesting, he takes them up, only three, to the mountain to pray, to the mountain to have a word with God, the one who has all words, the one who speaks, the one who is part of himself, and he, as he begins to talk with God, his appearance changes, and his face shines, and his clothes turn absolutely white, and he's able to talk with Moses and Elijah somehow as he crosses over this barrier, and it's quite an amazing thing as you look at all of this happening. Here's one of the mountains in which they believe they where he was transfigured, Hermes. That's a climb. You know what? Anytime you're above snow line, that's a climb. I'm going to say it wasn't when there's snow there, but I really don't know. But that's, that's a mountain. And it says they went up to a high mountain. This is one. There's several mountains that people, different people think. Some think Tabor, some think Hermes. And so, as you look at what this mountain could have been, he brings them up there so that, well, they fall asleep. But they're there to be able to see the conversation. And the conversation is about his departure. His conversation is about his death, because both Moses and Elijah had very unusual deaths. We don't see it recorded where they died. Somehow Moses, we know, did, and he was there with God, and then, okay, he's not. And we don't know where he was buried or anything. God took care of all of that. Elijah goes up in the whirlwind to heaven, and he's not. And Jesus is about to have a very personal death experience on a cross. And he begins to talk about this as as those men had faced the end, so Jesus faces the end and needs to talk to someone about this. And Peter makes the mistake of saying, well, let's make three places of worship, three tents, three. And I like the way he puts this, God came And they were in the cloud. The cloud surrounded them, overshadowed them. And then the voice comes out of the cloud. This is my beloved son, my chosen one. Listen to him. That's got to be scary. Have you ever been in a cloud? You have. You were probably in an airplane at the time. Clouds don't hit the ground very often here in Arizona. Maybe Flagstaff, but... uh, You have to be up pretty high to where the clouds come down and you're actually in the cloud and you can't see anything around you. But you can hear really well. And when God speaks, you need to listen. Things happen. And so who does Jesus take on the mountain with him? He doesn't take Judas... Why would you take Judas? There's no point in it. He takes the ones he can trust. He takes the one who confesses that I believe, Jesus, you are the son of the living God. He takes the ones who had left the whole boatload of fish and followed him. And they had walked away from everything. He takes the one who have left everything to follow him. 
He takes the one who got out of the boat in order to walk on water with him. He takes the ones who keep their word that they will be with him. He takes the ones who show up at the trial, a little bit of running away, but then they show up at the trial and not so much faith there. Peter denies him, but he's there. He's trying as hard as he can to be there. And Jesus is working with him through that. Would he take you? I guess you have to earn that. Would he take us with him to the mountain as people who could watch as he begins to talk with some people who understand about his death? It's not just opening up to his disciples. It's opening up to Moses and Elijah And it ought to give us insight into how big God really is. How big Jesus is that he can just step across at any point. Now he chooses the top of the mountain, maybe so there's not other people around. Maybe so that he can make a difference. All of these are acting in a faith that is not logical. All of these events, all of these stories, and you can keep reading through the book of Luke, all of them have to do with faith. All of them have to do with this this amazing God who does such amazing things that he is able to just say the word and it happens. We need to be able to understand what this is like. I think we've been there before. The child who jumps into his father's arms. It's great, isn't it? Have you ever been there? I remember the jump. Catch me. Dad's always saying, jump to me. I remember saying, okay, jump. And you can watch it up here on the stage right after church, I'm sure. (laughs) There's always kids up here who are going to say, catch me, or they're going to jump. And, yeah. Yeah. I also remember with my son, though, when I would say, jump, and he'd jump to me, and we did that for a while, and then he played the game a different way, and he said, catch me, and I wasn't anywhere close. (laughs) Wait a minute, we're not playing catch me, we're playing jump, and I think sometimes we get that mixed up with God, because when God says jump, okay, He spoke, he said it, we will do it, we will jump, we will be sure he will catch us. But we want to play catch me and jump and go, catch me. And him going, uh, wait a second. My son actually did that. I was clear across the pool. He's like three. Uh, Catch, dad. (laughs) Yeah, he had a little... uh, experience with water at that point, but uh, I did catch him on the first dunk. Uh, He went in, but uh, yeah, when the Word of God says that, jump, you'll be fine, you'll be safe. We need to be ready for that because that's what God did. We need to have this kind of faith, and Jesus acted in faith on things that were not logical. In fact, he can save us from our sin when we are not willing to cooperate. Are you kidding? That doesn't make any sense at all. But that's when he died on a cross is when we were not willing to cooperate. And he said, but I know you will. So when God speaks, do we do it? Do we do it immediately? Do we wait? Do we evaluate whether it will happen or not? And so what does God say about forgiveness? What does God say about eternal life? He says if you repent and are baptized and you form this covenant with God, then your sins are forgiven and he gives you eternal life. What does he say about pleasing God? What does he say about worship? He wants worship. And you guys took him serious because you showed up this morning. That's great. See how well you're doing? And you guys are still tuned in. I can't believe it. But that's because we take God seriously with what he says, 
What does he say about relationships? What does he say about people? Do we believe that what he says is definitely going to happen? If we do, what an incredible life we have. We are able to look at the world completely different because it's not about the numbers. It's about a God who loves us and cares for us and what an incredible life we're able to have. Today, maybe you're struggling with that and the numbers are scaring you. I want you to know that he says the blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. You're able to do that and just follow what God says because that's what makes all the difference. If you're hearing God and you feel like you need some help, if we can pray with you, if we can baptize you, if we can just give some counsel or help, we're glad to do that. Would you come while we stand and sing? Time.